we um, <clears throat> finish the uh, Sermon on the Mount. So this week, we're just simply going to uh, uh, do a bit of a topical. Um, what I'd like to do is read for you 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and then we're going to sort of back up and look at some of the things that this text has to tell us. But what I want us to focus on, particularly this morning, is the importance of the Spirit of God to open the eyes of the blind uh, and to enable us to receive the gospel. I think this will be encouraging to us, uh, particularly in the work of evangelism, because as uh, the Apostle Paul shares from his own example, uh, he didn't have to be um, as, as we often think we need to be in order to be useful to the Lord in bringing the gospel to others. We don't have to be the greatest speakers. We don't have to be the greatest arguers, the greatest philosophers, the greatest apologists. What we really need is the Spirit making the gospel powerful to save. Just share the gospel. Pray that God would work through His Spirit. So let's read what Paul has to say. Beginning in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 2. He says, And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God." Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, <clears throat> however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural man does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now, there's a lot of things in this passage. I'm not intending to try to cover everything, but I do want us to look again at the primary thing. And that is that the Spirit of God is the one who opens the eyes of the blind. He is the one who makes the difference between salvation or no salvation, even where the gospel is actually preached, even where it is shared. But let's back up for a bit and just uh, take a running start at this. Now, when Paul first came to Corinth, it was on his uh, second missionary journey. And the first thing he did when he arrived in Corinth was to reach out to the Jews. We actually, we, well, we read in, in Acts 18, verse 4. And he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. Now, of course, he went to where they met, the synagogue. Uh, he went when they were meeting, which was on their Sabbath. This is the Old Testament Sabbath which was Saturday, not on the Lord's Day. On the Lord's Day, he would be worshiping with the people of God. But he went there to prove to them from the Scriptures that Jesus was their Messiah. He went there to preach the gospel. Now, the Greeks that Luke says were also there were either proselytes, 
you know, converts to the Jewish faith, or more likely, they were God-fearers, those who believed the Old Testament Scriptures. They believed in the Jewish God, but they stopped short of circumcision. But this is how Paul would evangelize. Whenever he would come to a city or a town, he would first go to the synagogue. Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. God sent Jesus to the Jews first. And so Paul would go to them first. Uh, notice what he says in Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. The reason why Paul says that is because the Jews had priority. Jesus was sent to them first, and so he would always go to them first. Now, we also need to realize that, that the Lord, in his great love and patience, made sure that all of his old covenant people, all of the Jews, had a chance to hear the gospel. Again, why he gave them the priority is the entire Roman Empire is evangelized. He gave them all the chance to hear it and either to receive or reject it before he ended their religion definitively in 70 AD. Remember that uh, the sacrifices that they were offering between the time Jesus laid down his life and the time the temple were destroyed were no longer able to take away their sins. When Jesus died on the cross, that was the, the sacrifice that God would accept. That was the only sacrifice. That's the reason why the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. But the Lord allowed that religion to continue. And by the way, after Jesus died, that religion is called their religion and not God's anymore because he set it aside. It was abolished. But he allowed it to continue. He allowed the temple to continue to stand until they were able to hear about the fulfillment of all the sacrifices in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's God's grace. I mean, the temple stood for many, many years. That religion went on for many, many years, and God allowed it to go for 40 more years after the time Jesus died because of his love towards the Jews, that he might bring Christ to them. Now, sadly, as we read the account of what happened in Corinth, the majority of Jews there rejected Paul's message. They did what, what Paul says that many of the Jews do in Romans 9, verse 32. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. They didn't believe that Jesus was God's son. They didn't believe that Jesus had done it all through his life, through his death, that they could be justified, that they could be made right with God simply by trusting him, simply by receiving him and what he had done to save them. They didn't have to work for salvation. It was a free gift, but that was the stumbling block of the Jews. Now, when they rejected Jesus Christ, Paul turned to the Gentiles. And this was also a part of God's plan in order to make them jealous so that they might receive him. Paul writes in Romans chapter 11, verse 11, I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? talking about the Jews, may it never be, but by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. And so we read in Acts 18, verse 6, but when they, that is the Jews, resisted and blasphemed, he, that is Paul, shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am clean from now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And what he meant by that, of course, is I've, I've discharged my responsibility. I've told you about Jesus. My hands are clean from your blood. Your blood be on your own heads. If you're going to perish, it's because of you, not because of me. But now I'm going to go to the Gentiles. And the result, as we read through uh, the book of Acts, many of the Gentiles were saved. And some of the Jews were saved. And a church was formed in Corinth. Now, I think perhaps the most interesting thing to look at here is the way that Paul went about reaching both the Jews and the Gentiles. We already saw that the preaching of the cross, that you can be justified by faith alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, apart from works, 
was a stumbling block to the Jews. They rejected that idea. They had already hated Jesus and put him to death on a cross. But what did Paul do to reach them? Did he try to find another way to go around? Did he try to find another message that would be more suitable to them? No, he preached the cross, the stumbling block of the Jews. And we're going to see why, of course, he did that. He's already told us it is the power of God to salvation. Another message won't do. You've got to preach that message, even to those who reject it. Now, he goes on to say that it was foolishness to the Gentiles. Remember when Paul was, you know, in, in Athens uh, on Mars Hill in the Areopagus speaking to the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers? He was preaching Christ to them. Sometimes we think maybe he wasn't doing that. He, he was trying to find a point of connection between kind of their belief system and, and the true God, but he does get down to the fact that God sent a man through whom he's going to judge everyone, and he's proven that he is by raising him from the dead. But remember when Paul said that God had raised him from the dead, they sneered at even the possibility of a resurrection. But even though the Gentiles who were, you know, these, these wise men, these philosophers, rejected the gospel, Paul continued to preach it. He didn't try to find another way to reach them, another way around this, another message but he preached the gospel even to the Gentiles in Corinth, and there were many who believed. Now notice, they didn't believe because he was such a great speaker. Paul says he came to them in weakness and in fear and trembling. I think that actually describes a lot of us when we try to evangelize, doesn't it? He wasn't an overwhelming personality, and come, he didn't come with these great oratory skills. They didn't believe because he was able to persuade them with powerful arguments the way that philosophers were likely to do when they would try to prove their view of the world and existence. He simply preached the gospel, the message of the cross in the power of the Holy Spirit with the confidence that the Spirit of God was going to work through that gospel to open eyes and to change hearts. Now, let's think about our situation today because things really haven't changed. People still see the message of the cross as foolishness. They're still coming up with reasons why not to believe the gospel. Today, evolution is the excuse of choice. That's what's in vogue. God's way of reaching them is still the same. We don't have to be great speakers. We don't have to be able to give them irrefutable evidence. We don't have to convince them with powerful arguments in order to bring them to Jesus Christ. All we have to do is share the gospel with them. And, this is the part we don't want to miss, look to His Holy Spirit to do the work of converting them. Now, Paul tells us first in this text that the reason why people don't come to Jesus is not because they lack evidence. There's plenty of evidence. God made sure that everybody knows, first of all, that He is. Paul writes in Romans 1, verse 20, a passage which we should all be very familiar with by now. Paul says, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power, and His divine nature have been clearly seen, not just seen, but being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. The Bible says no one will be able to say on the day of judgment that they did not know that God exists, even though many say that today. Secondly, they're not suffering from a lack of motivation uh, to seek after this God because God has also made sure that everybody knows that they have broken His law and they are guilty. He's given them a conscience. Now, let me read this passage from uh, Romans chapter 1, verses 28 through 32, and I want us to pay particular attention to the closing verse. This is talking about their rejection of God in the creation. They worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator. God gives them over to a reprobate mind, and they begin to, to do you know, worse and worse sins. 
And then he, he, taught, he ends by saying this, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And then notice this. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they know that. They not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Now, how do they know these things? Because God reveals it to them, I think, through His Holy Spirit as a means of restraining them and their sins. But they know what they're doing is wrong. Conscience tells them, but they still do it. So there's no lack of motivation. They know not only that they've done what's wrong, but they feel guilty because of that. They know they're guilty before this God they see in creation, but they still don't seek Him. Now, there isn't a problem then with evidence. There isn't a problem with motivation. They know they're guilty and in trouble. So why don't they seek God? Why don't they come to Jesus? Well, there's another problem. Most people don't know what God's solution to the problem actually is, which is the gospel. But even if they did know it, they still wouldn't want it because they have a heart problem. Now, the one thing that God has not told the world through the creation is the gospel. That's the part he's actually left up to us. That's the privilege that we actually have to bring the gospel to them. That's what the Great Commission is all about. Jesus wouldn't have sent them out to, make, to disciple the nations if they didn't need to go, if the gospel was somehow written everywhere for people to see. We need to bring it to them. But the point I want to make here is this, and sometimes I think because we bring the gospel to people and they're not converted, we somehow begin to think that maybe we're not doing it right, maybe we're not good enough, maybe our, our arguments are not powerful enough, and so forth, but that's not the problem. You see, the gospel by itself isn't enough, and we don't need to add to it arguments, although they can be helpful sometimes. We don't need to, to add persuasiveness. I mean, Paul came in fear and trembling. What we need, of course, is the Holy Spirit to deal with their spiritual condition. Now, Paul tells us in our passage that there are two kinds of people in the world, those who are natural, those who are spiritual. Remember, Jesus reminded us last week there's only two roads that we can walk on, the broad road and the narrow road, and they lead to only two possible destinations, destruction and life. Paul is telling us here that there are two kinds of people who walk on these two roads. Now, those who are on the broad road, Paul calls natural. And what he means is that they're still in the condition in which they were born. Remember last week we saw that they went, we, we actually all went through the broad gate at conception. And these are still on the broad road that the gate leads to, and they've been walking on it since they've come into the world. Paul says here, what he means by what he says here is that they're worldly. They live like most of the people in this world, and I say most because there are some redeemed people. They're controlled by their fleshly appetites. Those are the sinful ones. They, they live by uh, these mottos, grab for all the gusto you can. You only go around once in life. You know, basically, if it feels good, do it. If that's what you feel like doing, if that's what you want, do it. Well, that's what it means to live fleshly. That's what it means to be natural. That's what it means to be worldly. It's just the opposite of what it means to be under the control of God's Spirit, okay? If the, if the Spirit of God says, this is what the Lord wants you to do in the Word of God, that's what you're supposed to do. You see, that's how we live, but that's not how the people of the world live, not those who are natural. Now, those who are natural don't always look that bad to us because they're not as bad as they could possibly be because God's Spirit 
is holding them back. He's restraining them. Conscience is one of the ways by which he does this. Laws in cultures are also a way he does that. But that doesn't mean that there's anything good in them, even though we might see them doing things that are outwardly good. Remember what Paul says in Romans 3 verse 10. There is none righteous, not even one. There's none who does good. There's none who seeks after God. They actually hate God, and they refuse to worship God. They refuse to serve God. Remember what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 8, where he uses the word flesh to describe those who are natural. He says this, for those who are according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God hates him, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, it's unwilling to worship him, to serve him, for it is not even able to do so. They don't have the ability to do it. And so the conclusion, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Is there anything good in a person who is natural, in a person who doesn't have the Spirit of God? No. Well, it's no wonder then that their response to the gospel is as Paul portrays it in our passage, 1 Corinthians 2.14. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. And what he's saying here is they don't accept the Spirit's witness, what he reveals about Jesus in the gospel. It seems foolish to them. They don't understand why anyone would waste their time with these kinds of things. Now, even though they know that God exists, even though they know that they're in trouble, they have done such a good job of deceiving themselves, of suppressing the truth, of covering over the truth, that it no longer even seems real to them. Sharing the gospel with an unconverted person, with a natural person, is like telling them that Aesop's fables are actually true or that there really is a force that has a light and a dark side to it. As a matter of fact, they might be more willing to believe that than they would to believe the gospel because the gospel grates against the sin that's in them, whereas these other things really do not. But even when a person becomes convinced that, that the gospel is true, it still doesn't mean that they're going to come to Jesus. It still doesn't mean that they want Jesus. They might want Jesus for a ticket out of hell, but they really don't want to be with him. They really don't want to spend eternity with him in a place of pure holiness and righteousness. And the point, of course, that Paul's making here is this. They never will want that unless the Spirit of God does something, unless he works in their hearts. These things can only be understood, they can only be appreciated, they can only be seen for what they are through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. No one is saved apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. Again, remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless you are born again of the Spirit. You cannot see the kingdom, you cannot enter the kingdom, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. The flesh profits nothing, it is the Spirit who gives life. And, of course, that brings us to the second group that Paul talks about here. <clears throat> Paul calls those who are on the narrow road spiritual. And that's what he refers to in Romans 8, verses 9 and 10, as being in the Spirit. Remember, he writes this, However, you are not in the flesh, you are not natural men, women, children, but in the Spirit, if <clears throat> indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. you. You see the dividing line here between flesh, those who are fleshly, those who are natural, and those who are in the, you know, spiritual or in the spirit? The spirit of God dwells in you. That is the difference. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. Those who are spiritual, those who have the Spirit of God, have their eyes opened by God's Spirit. 
to the truth. The Spirit of God shows us that the gospel, far from being a stumbling block, is the only stepping stone that actually leads to heaven. And so we jump on it. That it isn't foolishness, but really it's God's wisdom. You know, the, again, the philosophers look at the gospel as foolishness, the idea of the resurrection, but we look at it and we say, you know what? This is the only possible way that we could have been saved. And we are so thankful that God gave him to us so that we might be saved. He reveals to us, that is the Spirit of God, what, what God has actually given to us in Jesus, the things we cannot see with our eyes. He explains to us things that we couldn't have understood even if somebody had told us, remember Jonathan Edwards said, it's like trying to explain color to a blind man or music to a man who is deaf. It's something they can't understand because they do not have this faculty of the Holy Spirit to understand it. It's not so much information, but it's the beauty of what it is that we're, we're talking about here. We see something of that beauty because we have the Holy Spirit. When Paul says that the Spirit of God is our foretaste of heaven, he is the down payment of heaven, he's talking about that experience we have of the love of God and that which we see of the beauty of holiness. That is really what heaven is all about, and that's the, the taste the Spirit of God gives us, and that's what causes us to reach out and receive the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we received and believed in him, and we were saved. The difference between the natural and the spiritual man is that the spiritual man has the Spirit of God. The natural man doesn't. Now this brings us secondly and really lastly to how we can bring the lost to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to realize that natural revelation, what God shows everybody in nature, is not enough. It leaves them without excuse, but it can't convert them. Conscience isn't enough. It shows them that they're guilty and they're in danger, but that's all it does. If we could become the greatest speakers, the greatest orators in the world, if we could bring the best and most convincing arguments, that still wouldn't be enough. Even bringing the gospel isn't enough. I mean, how many people have heard it? Have heard it from what we consider to be great preachers? You know, how many thousands and millions of people did Billy Graham preached to, and yet how many of those were actually saved? Very, very, very few. The gospel by itself is not enough. Now, we do need to give them the gospel. They can't be saved without the gospel. They need to know what Jesus did. They need to know what they need to do in order to be saved. But for them to be saved, we need to bring it to them in the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to pray that we might be filled with his presence and speak as those who are not only convinced that what we're telling them is true, not just for us, but also that it's true for them. We need to care about them. That's really what the power of the Holy Spirit is, is a concern for another soul that is strong enough to actually reach out to them and tell them about Jesus. But let's not miss the point of this whole text. They also need to hear this message with something more than their natural ears. They need spiritual ears that only the Spirit of God can give. He needs to make the message powerful to save. But you see, they're not going to ask for the Spirit of God, are they? They're not going to seek God for it because there is none who seeks after God. God actually has to work in their hearts before they're going to ask Him for that particular blessing. So, we need to be those who actually pray and who ask for God's mercy for them, to give them His Spirit, to open their deaf ears that they might hear and that they might be saved. You know, the greatest evangelists who ever lived were of this persuasion that they could not persuade people to be saved, but they could preach the gospel and they knew that God would work. Spurgeon was one of those, and Whitfield was certainly one of those, perhaps two of the greatest evangelists who ever lived. And I'm not saying there haven't been great evangelists who didn't believe this, but I'm just saying those who believe this were also great evangelists. Now, what was the secret to George Whitfield's success? Well, he had 
several things going for him, didn't he? He certainly was a very godly man. I mean, he sought the Lord one time to the point of almost killing himself. But he gave his life unstintingly to the Lord's service. He was a great orator. Uh, he could be heard almost a mile away. He had a very powerful voice. And people were actually quite moved even just by the way he moved. It was, it was an interesting thing. It was almost like he was built to be listened to. He had certain gifts from the Lord. But the greatest secret of his success was really in this. He preached the gospel. He wasn't ashamed of it. And even though people sometimes would throw rocks and stones, dead cats and various other things at him when he was preaching, he didn't let that stop him. He continued to preach. But as he preached, he not only was looking at the audience, but he was also looking to God. He had his eye on heaven, looking to the Lord for his blessing and praying that God would come upon his audience with the Holy Spirit. And very often, the Lord did. He sent his Spirit Whitfield could see them change, and he could see the Lord just turning their lives around. He, he called it melting, and usually it was, he could see it because of the tears that were coming out of their eyes. Now, that's what we need. We need to share the gospel, but we also need this blessing of the Holy Spirit, and the Lord will give us this blessing. He will work with us by His Holy Spirit if we are willing to share this message and ask for the Spirit and believe that the Lord will do what He promised He would do when we ask for the Spirit. So let's just be encouraged this morning that, again, we don't have to be great speakers. I mean, Whitfield was a great speaker. Spurgeon was a great speaker. But you don't have to be a great speaker. You don't even have to be a great apologist. You don't have to speak with the greatest wisdom. But what you do need is the gospel, and all of us have it. If we've been saved, we, we know what it is. And we need the Spirit. And God says He will give His Spirit. If we ask for it, He will bring His people to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So may the Lord help us to see that and give us the grace to ask for that ministry of the Spirit. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And as we do, um, let's, let's also think about preparing to come to the table. Uh, to put it in terms of what we've just looked at, to come to the table, we need to be spiritual and not natural. We need to be those who have the Spirit of God, those who are, have trusted Jesus, those who are being uh, made like Jesus, those who are following Jesus, those who are worshiping Jesus and serving Jesus, we need to be repenting of all of our sins. And that's, if we're trusting in Jesus, that's what we'll be able to do. But if we're natural, we need to stay away from the table. If we're unconverted because of the warning the Lord gives us in His Word about uh, judgment, about discipline, if we come to the table without having repented of our sins, if we come to the table without having trusted in Jesus... So as we bow for a moment of prayer and ask the Lord to apply this to us, let's apply it in this way, asking ourselves the question, are we natural? Are we worldly? Are we in the flesh? Does that describe us? Or are we spiritual? Do we have the Spirit of God? And let me just encourage you, if you examine your lives and come to the conclusion that you really are natural and not spiritual, go to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only one who can give you the Holy Spirit and change your heart and make you willing to come. Trust in the Lord. Well, let, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's prepare to come to the table.